Distinguishing the terminology objective versus subjective. Does that sound familiar? So remind me, subjective means what? And objective. Synonymous with what? Facts. Facts. And then we gave examples of subjectivity, something that's subjective. we make this distinction between, and you might remember this from grade school learning and literature and grammar, first person versus third person. First person point of view versus third person point of view. So first person point of view is considered to be subjective. Observer dependent third person point of view, objective and observer independent. So, why do you think first person is in the form of singular or plural? <laughs> Does it mean many people or one person? Singular. And third person? Yes. It could be an omniscient view or it can also be third. Yeah, a third person. So how, how or why would subjectivity be connected to first person point of view and objectivity or facts be associated with a third person point of view? Also, something interesting that we'll get into when we get into the issue of mind and consciousness. I have no access to your first person experience. So the way that marshmallows taste to you may be very different from me. Uh, we brought this up last class about, was it somebody mentioned mushrooms? It's like I hate mushrooms. Uh, how many people like mushrooms though? Does it magically change chemical composition when it reaches and that's why? No, it's something inside. And so you can analogize, uh, oh, your experience might be like mine. And oftentimes there's a lot of overlap, but you can never get the same access that you yourself would have of your own perceptions and experience. And so this presents some unique problems in philosophy of mind which we'll touch on later on. But third person objective is, like you said, kind of like a God's eye point of view. Or as my uh, PhD uh, advisor messed up once and said, uh, a dog's eye point of view. I mean, a God's eye. <laughs> like, what is a dog's eye point of view? Um, <laughs> Abstract. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, for example, I, I take the marshmallow and I eat it and go, wow, it's, uh, it tastes like a negative description. Now, I don't know if that's a factual description or not, uh, because let's say I'm the only person around. 
They could be the same where we look outside and there, oh, I see a sun. Well, is it just a perception like the taste of marshmallows? Or is that something, an objective fact that you can discover? Well, this is where third person confirmation becomes quite important. That if something is factual, notice it's observer dependent, meaning the truth value, or what we say in philosophy, veracity, is not dependent on us. Whereas the taste of marshmallows or mushrooms is exactly dependent on the taster. How many of you have heard the, sometimes it's put into a joke or a derogatory uh, phrase to put down philosophers? If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, you go, what crazy philosophers? It's, they're running, remember, they're running around wondering if they exist, and wondering if trees in the forest make sound when it's around. That's a trick question, though. What would you say? Would it, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, I would say that people, um, I mean, areas in space, like, we can't hear that when it's causing collisions, but somehow people find a way to hear it. Good, I think you're getting on to something. If still makes a sound, but we couldn't confirm it, we just have to say, we've heard a tree make a sound before, so we assume this one as well. Well, what is sound? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> is it? <laughs> isn't it, per isn't it <laughs> perceived <laughs> sound, that, yeah, or percussion? So, sound is, put more simply, sound is what's heard. So retranslate that sentence. And what's heard are the percussion waves, right, coming through. Because there's many vibration waves that you're not going to get to hear. So it needs to be within the audible range, the acoustics of your mechanics of your ear. So now let's retranslate that question. If sound is what's heard, listen to the question now. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, is it heard? No. no. Oh, the, se the sound percussion's there. And if somebody were, yes. So the waves, the percussion waves are going out. But isn't it a trick question? Isn't it silly though? Yes, it makes a sound. No. That's like saying, if nobody's around to taste marshmallows, is it mar are marshmallows being tasted? It's like, no. Of course not. So notice how important it is to dissect language and say, what does that word mean? Words are thrown out all the time. Haven't you seen those memes where, uh, I think it's a quote from uh, Princess Bride. I don't think you know what that word, actually, I'm, yeah, I'm butchering it. But I don't think that word means what you think. Yeah, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, people throw that all the time. Words out and it's like, hmm. I'm not sure that's the correct usage. That's why it's important to be able to define our terms. By the way, here's something interesting. Do you know what actual field, uh, well, lawyers, for example. My wife was a lawyer. And do you know what, now lawyers have to do a four-year degree. What? major do lawyers major in in undergrad, majority? You learn how to, and here's a similarity, this is why it goes really well as prep work for going into law is because you're learning to think critically, define your terms. In law, it's all about being precise. You don't want to use double talk, vague language when you're writing up a contract where it's like, well, it could mean this, and it could mean that. I guess we'll never know. It's all subjective, right? It's like, well, I hope not, because we're putting this man on the chair, right? And uh, it better not be your opinion. 
it better be fact. So if we go back to the sun and the earth example, and you're sitting here up on top of the earth and looking at the sun, and you're wondering, man, is that my opinion? Am I really experiencing this objectively as a fact, or is it something like taste, color preference? Well, what would help? The truth of that should not be dependent on, if it's objective fact, should not be dependent on you. In other words, if everybody disappeared on the face of the earth, would the truth value of that statement, the earth has a sun, be false? No. No. Same as one plus one equals two. If there was nobody around to confirm it, would it just magically be not true? I mean, no. the world Well, remember what we said. There's, this is an important distinction between actually knowing a fact versus thinking that you know something to be a fact when it's not. Most of us in most of our lives think that, yes, I know this, I think I know this, and how many times have we been wrong? Unless you're a narcissist. I know it all. We win. You never learn anything. Or change your mind on anything. So that's an important distinction. So it helps that, well, if you have plurality of people to confirm that, then it helps you to realize, okay, that's not something just inside of me or my opinion. It looks like it's being confirmed. It doesn't science work this way. You don't have a scientist go, I have this amazing discovery that I did in the lab, um, but I'm not going to show it to anybody. Would we just accept that as fact? Sure, I guess. He's a scientist. I guess he's or maybe, maybe yeah. people do do that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. What are you talking about? Uh, that's called appeal to authority fallacy. So, whereas... Sorry, this belongs... Observer-dependent, again, can taste or sound exist if there's no tasters or hearers? No. It can't. So, because that's something within inside ourselves. Well, that gets to the next question about, we talked about, and I think this is where we left off. Does science require universal agreement? So you got to, if, correct me if I'm wrong, most of you had said that when it comes down to subjectivity or objectivity, we wanted to say that science is concerned uh, primarily with objectivity and facts, whereas philosophy, tends to be more subjective. Is that correct? Is that? Now, what was the motivation behind that? What would make you think that? Why not the other way around? Why not say science is a bunch of opinions and philosophy is factual? Because science has to be true and philosophy is not all that legitimate. How do we? What does that mean to prove a theory true? It's been tested. Okay. But you can test something and not prove it. So you need to test it. What else? So what does empirical mean? Something, yeah, it's synonymous with what's physical and material that you detect with your senses. So would this be something empirical? So how do I know that exists? And somebody gives an argument that, pick it, touch it. How can you deny that that exists? So that's a way to test. Uh, but what about mathematics? We said mathematics is very certain. Um, that's completely non-empirical. It's the most abstract discipline that you can really take. It's like, go, go fetch the number two from the brain in the classroom. It's like, you can't. Oh, here, I got it. That's not number two. That's an example of two things that are different. 
illustrating the abstract concept of number two. So would we say that mathematics cannot be proved? So if that's the case, we might be empiricists. In which case, I'm trying to get you to think about, we throw these terms out, oh, it's proven, or we need to prove it. But what goes on behind proof, what makes up a proof, is very difficult. And it depends on, really, kind of how the way you think about things, right? Basically, uh, you're studying it, you're doing tests on it, um, you're getting the kind of results that you want for those tests, so with various kind of behavior, right? Is reason proof enough? Well, everything that's proven uses reason. So, how many people have math class? Don't you have proofs? Do you test them? Or do you just use reason? I mean, do you pour your math into a, an Ermeyer flask and put it on the Bunsen burner? Hmm. That test is. That's right. The math checks out. <laughs> <laughs> do you see, uh, remember what we're doing here too. You put forth a thesis and I push back. You respond push back again, and you should be doing this among one another and within your own thinking as well, that, ooh, I have an idea, but what about this? Yeah, but then I'd answer this. That kind of inner dialogue helps us narrow in and tune into the, the truth, hopefully. So, what about, so what we, I think you're pointing out is how do we prove things empirically? Well, you better be able to sense them and test. So a lot of the things that you're naming are the scientific method. But as we pointed out, an objection to that or something contrary to that would be mathematics. We, we can't apply the scientific math, method to mathematics, but we have mathematical proofs. So what else might be behind a proof? Or when do you say, yeah, they've proved it? Because we could test something or, or even sense it, and somebody says you haven't proved it. So what is the standard for proof? Consistency. Okay. Consistency, that's right. If you have an inconsistency or a contradiction, you can throw it out. It can't be. And that's because, by definition, contradictions are false. So anytime someone contradicts themselves, they are speaking falsely. So that's a great that is testing for consistency, which is exactly what we do in mathematics groups oftentimes. Something called reductio ad absurdum, or arguments by contradiction. You assume what you don't want to prove, and if you get generate an inconsistency or a contradiction, then you know, oh, where I started off from must have been false, my assumption, so it must be the other. The other thing. Yeah, good guys. What else? What about disagreement within the community as a whole? Is one of the psychological motivating factors behind why one would say science seems to be concerned more with facts and objectivity than philosophy is because, well, just like the sun example, you can get a plurality of people to confirm something so that you know that that's not just in my head. It's not just my experience. Okay, you're seeing it too. There's a sun outside. Great. Okay, that might be important. Is, and you go into a science classroom, remember we use the example of ask an established science question how many elements are there? Oh, do we live in a geocentric or heliocentric universe? What are scientists going to say? Or science professors. We live, is the Earth the center or the sun? <coughs> now, is that an opinion or a fact? I want to say that's a fact. Right? Right, that's, yeah. 
Now, by the way, everything you say, I'm going to tear down in just a few <laughs> No, no, this is really important. It's getting um, this stuff out. And you guys are hitting all the right points, so you're doing very good. Or here. Um, how, how do you know the sun is the center if no one's ever been up there? So where do you get that information? So we kind of go subsequently, we'll see the moon, we can go beyond the belt or whatever. Yeah, I'll, I'll, what do you guys have to say? I mean, they used to believe that it was geocentric until they had access to more technology and a measurement of the, the way the planets move. And they realize everything moves around the sun. So you don't have to have gone through the sun to know that we move around it because of the way that the gravity between us and the sun is. And so we prove that a bigger thing than the sun, the universe that we're revolving around, the sun is also revolving around. So I'm going to hold off on, I want to try to answer that. I don't want to give the spoiler alerts again. On the, but I am interested to hear what you have to say. Anybody else want to add something that might? Well, maybe for concepts such as astronomy and mathematics, I feel like uh, for the empirical sciences, you have the scientific method, and for abstract concepts, you have logic and reason. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, good uh, ones. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. And we're going to study those. Logic is the science of the rules of thought, um, and it's used in every discipline. And so we're going to philosophy studies that. Um, how to think correctly and use a reason in the right way and it's out exactly establish um, things as being factual versus simply an opinion. So that kind of universal agreement for the most part, um, setting aside the kind of very theoretical questions, uh, does dark matter exist? Um, is there antimatter? You know, these kinds of uh, various issues that come up in quantum theory that are very theoretical. Putting that aside, I mean the established science, you go in and you get universal conformity on these questions, the sort of answers that you get. You're going to get the same sort of answers across the board. Now go into a philosophy department and ask the philosophy professor some philosophical questions. Here's some examples of philosophical questions. What is the correct political society? or form of government? Do human beings have a soul? Is there a beginning to the universe? Or is it infinite? Has it always existed? Is there a God? Um, is morality objective? These kinds of questions, what are you going to get universal answers uh, conforming across the board? Now, might that be a psychological motivation for white people might say that's because it's more opinionated. Everybody has their different perspective on. Okay, now let me overthrow. Let's do a coup de talk. Let's overthrow the. That's that back and forth. So it's important to put forth a thesis again, and then have an ant uh, antithesis uh, position to that. Do you know what counter examples are? Like right, so if I said everyone in Fullerton is over 26 years old. Now, how, what's the counterexample to refute that? Do you need to go check everybody's ID in Fullerton to know that's true? You just need one for You just need everybody. one. Find somebody that's younger than, and you've overthrown that, you've refuted it. So if a necessary condition for objectivity is within that particular community, whether it's a scientific community or whatever discipline, universal agreement, let's find a counter example. Okay. Let's say, let's take the something that we know to be more clear to illustrate something that's kind of obscure right now. Go, go more, find something more certain that we all hold to be an objective fact. That's why I like mathematics. One plus one equals. Okay, 
What's your breakfast party? Yeah, it, it could be that. Yeah, that's a good example. Let's do the quadratic. Or we can do the inverse square law. Newton's inverse square law for gravity. Since we brought up gravity. Let's do the quadratic equation. So, if that's objective fact, we all hold to that. It's not the professor's opinion. Quadratic equation. So, that should mean that I should get universal answers when I ask. Well, if I handed that out to the classroom and I get back different responses, then would that just prove that it's an objective fact? No, someone did it wrong. Right. Good. Nice one. There is the methodology. Did you think correctly and work through the steps properly? There is motivational issues too. What a Unbeknownst to you, outside of class, you paid everybody off to give different answers. I'll give you five bucks to not give the right answer. Everybody gives a different answer. Now, somebody who comes in who doesn't know mathematics and sees this, wow, everybody's given a different position or answer on this. So, psychologically speaking, they might want to say, because there is no objective answer. It's all relative. It's just subjective. It's everybody's opinion. That's your... We wouldn't hold to that. We would say, no, they're just wrong. That people can... So it's, do you see we use a counterexample of something that we know to be objective fact, yet we could get disagreement. Now think about the other way. Just because we have universal agreement doesn't make it true. You can use some pretty horrendous examples from history to find out that's not. Communities that believe universal so that something, but we you know it's wrong. So, we have another counterexample. Just because people are giving different answers doesn't mean that there's not an objective fact to it. It could be, as you pointed out, it could be that they're thinking about it incorrectly. It could be the difficulty. What if I gave you a question about, uh, I can put up some derivative or compute the limit. Uh, do you think I'll get the same answer? Put some function up and have me take the derivatives of the, not unless you're good at calculus, you're probably, so it could be the subject matter is quite difficult. It could be one reason. And again, motivational, especially when you get into, so mathematics, there's nothing that really normative or anything that you really have to lose by concluding that one plus one equals two. It's not like you're going to have to like change your diet or your religion um, or politics. Right? I'm going to change my ways. One plus one of these two. Uh, it's pretty. It's what we would call value neutral. But when you get into other disciplines, it often involves a lot of values and very complicated issues. That I know we like to say mathematics is so complicated. It's not. It's quite clear because you follow the methodology, you do it correctly, and you will get to the conclusion. It doesn't take in psychological motivations, experience, culture. That, that's why we like to use mathematics as examples, because it's quite clear in that way. But think about politics. It's a lot more complicated, isn't it? Does that mean, well, there's just no objective answer? No, it could be it's much more difficult. There's much more things to think about. Might philosophy, might not philosophy be something like that? Would we be so ready to say, yeah, it's just, well, the only real reason that we said so far is because, well, we're getting different answers. But as we saw, different answers to the same question doesn't mean that there's no objective fact. We had isolated several factors that might show us why that's, we're not getting the same sorts of answers. Also, 
It's the way that you're looking at it. If I drew up a historical timeline, uh, let's see, let's go back to the 6th century BC. And then we got the 1800s, 1800s, 1700s, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now we're in the 1800s. Vice versa, that. So if we ask a science question today, we establish science question, yes. How many elements in the periodic chart? Um, are there atoms? Yeah, we're going to get universal agreement. If you ask a philosophical question, Day and age, you might you'll get universal disagreement across the board. But it's your perspective, the way that you're looking at it. I start with the sixth century because that's really when the beginnings of science. Yes. If I look at this historical timeline here. Science, the history of science, from the 6th century BC up until 2018. Today, if I ask a science question, am I going to get universal agreement across the board? How many elements are there? Well, that's going to change. We're going to say four. We're going to say 119. Is the Earth the center of the solar system or the sun? Universal disagreement. In any particular age, and it's going to have to do because of the nature of science itself, it uses different methodologies than other disciplines. And so, but if we were to look at this whole historical timeline here and ask philosophical questions about politics, ethics, Man, the soul, God, guess what? For the most part, you're going to get universal agreement. Isn't that interesting? It's not up until just very recent that question about God. What did philosophers and scientists believe? Across the board. It would be almost impossible to find an atheistic scientist or philosopher. They'll give, does a human have a soul? Yes, across these big questions, philosophical questions, across the spans of human history, of thought, for the most part, you get universal conformity. But yes, in any particular age, you go in and you ask people, of course you have different. And that might show that in fact, they're studying and approaching the study of the subject matter in different ways. Now let's look at this question here. Does science bring about progress? Progressive suit. Progress, right? I hope. Or digress. Yeah, I've just been watching all these crazy AI movies. I watched Extinction last night. I've watched the whole series of Westworld. Some of the real, like the real life AI, just like the thing that they say in the kids. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it started on. So I worked in philosophy of mind in my PhD. And this is where AI develops uh, a lot. Of it. it comes out of philosophy of mind. We'll get into this when we get to the section of philosophy of mind. But I encountered a lot of, even my PhD professor was a, a strong component of strong AI. And hands down, they always said the robots, the AI, are going to take over the world and kill it. Right? Right? Elon Musk and all these nut pieces that say this kind of stuff. Uh, well, if that's true, why are you building it? Idiots, right? Does that make any sense? It's like, 
I'm going to build this thing that's going to kill everybody in class right now. And you're going to be like, don't do it. <laughs> no, I think I should. I really, for some uh, deep down inside, I feel it's the right thing to do. <laughs> because it'll just make things much, that much more easier and more efficient. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's a funny thing. But, um, so that's, that's a good question. Well, what about food? Yeah, and we'll talk about this. I'm actually delivering a paper at a big conference uh, in Romania in January about technology uh, in the modern age. And as we said, the Greek word that technology comes from is technic, where we get technique. I would like technique. Well, technique, techne is a tool. It's a tool to do something, to produce something. And in of itself, techne and technology is not bad. It's what's motivating. Well, what do you want to use that tool for? You don't want to get a ball if you want to start breaking people's kneecaps. Like, then you're misusing technology. And now everybody's digressing to have broken legs. Um, same thing with the, but you could use it in a good way. So, exactly what you pointed out. With nuclear uh, science, you could destroy the world, or you could create human efficient energy. Yeah, so that's an excellent point. Other thoughts? Do you really want to know what I have to say? Yeah, I do. You want to know what your fellow... I'm going to hold off. I don't want you to know exactly what it is. I'll give little, little breadcrumbs and let you figure out. What do you think? I think with our society today, with technology, we make, we make it not for the future, as we like to say, or we look for the future. I think it's more like we make technology for our benefit and our present benefit. Because it's really easy to make technology that helps us now. But when we, when we need to make technology for the future, it will work. To help us in the future, we're that much more reluctant, correct? So, are you seeing maybe we're being short sighted in the way that we're using technology? I want to now, I want to have this convenience. I'm not thinking about the consequences. I'd like to hear you. Yes, sir, I'm back. And you use like, uh, like was in the, one of the, was it Samsung or Google, or they, they put up a, an AI that answered to whatever you asked it, and it only took like a couple hours before people started asking it a bunch of stuff. And then And it, yeah, it was, uh, it, it also said that I went to kill the man. Yeah. Wow. Um, so maybe it's not like the technology itself, because that's not how it started off. Maybe it's like the people. Technology won't do anything. It's, it's just material without people making it do something for a particular purpose. So yeah, if the people are bad, if the culture is bad, they're probably going to produce bad technology. I mean, bad in the sense of harm. It's going to hurt people. I remember one time I was watching this film and it was basically getting into AI and how um, in the future people, like rich people, instead of dying, they upload their brain onto the internet and they'd be able to look back at this. But then it was showing basically how sad and depressed those people were and that life could be just because of mortality. You know what you have to watch? If you haven't, I know I'm going to say this and you've seen it. Um, Black Mirror. Yeah. I love that show. I thought it was fiction. I mean, non fiction. I, it's, I thought it was fiction. Turns out it's real. No way. Yeah, it's real, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, it's not like yeah. we're filming like a live. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But based on like real ideas and stuff like that. Yeah, you have to realize, too, that when you see technology come out as you move, it's 30, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. You same haven't with, seen it. Same thing with cars. They're like like Mercedes and all that. They're already 20 years ahead. And they just release cars every now and down there. I remember when I was a kid, I, I liked airplanes and jet planes. I remember when the fastest jet came out, the SR-71 Blackbird. Like, 
Mach 3, and I was like, ah, get the poster and build a model. And buy the ticket, take the ride. And that was, that was like in the late 80s or something like that. Uh, 89 or 87, I forget exactly. The, do you know when they came out with the, the SR-71? The 50s? The 60s or something. Yeah, it's, isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I've even heard that you've run into AI now that you know I bet so. Skynet is here. So we'll get into I like I like using the cinema to have one of these two for. But let's go back to this question of progress. Why is there so much disagreement in philosophy versus agreement in the scientific community as a whole. Do you mean the scientific community is because we already progressed and the philosophy is still progressing? So you know, unless you have like a set opinion on it, if we're still progressing, we still don't know what the end is. Remember we talked about the Greeks and their different notions of knowledge? Want practical knowledge, praxis, oasis, is theoretical knowledge. So why do I want to learn if I'm a mathematician numbers? Okay, so this is the difference between just means and ends. Ends are goals. What things should be seen as means to an end? And what things should be seen as ends? Well, you can apply this with knowledge. If I'm an engineer, I'm studying numbers as a means to something else or an end in itself. Once it's an end, you don't need it for anything else. A means, right? a means to understand structure and support so you can make and build sound structures. Mathematics, mathematicians want to study numbers as a means for something or an end. An end. So it's not a practical knowledge. It's a theoretical knowledge. It's, well, numbers are beautiful and I just desire it. It would be like this. Why do we, you ask somebody, why do you love your parents? And they say, because the only reason why I love them is because they can use stuff to put on my head and on your food. Wouldn't that be strange? Wouldn't you find that there's something wrong with this person? <laughs> and the way they view parents. Should parents or the love of parents be viewed as a means to something else? Money. Give me money. No, that would seem perverse. Wouldn't a proper answer be, why do you love your parents? Because they're lovely. They're an end in themselves. Like, we used the example of art last time. Why do you want that Picasso? Because we make money off of it. But why do you want this beautiful, this other beautiful painting? Not to not to sell or do or to build a, a fort or a desk out of it or something. Because it's beautiful, and that's a perfect answer. We live in a modern technological age where you have been told since you were kids that the only reason why you want to learn and go to school is to do something, to make money, to do. But that's not how the history of thought and civilization and the universities thought about it. Why do you go to school and want to know something? Because it's beautiful worthwhile in itself. Isn't, isn't that a better answer? Now, there are some things that you would say, well, I'm an engineer, I need to know the math to produce. I need to learn the science because I'm a doctor and I want to heal people. That's practical knowledge, and they accepted that. But generally speaking, 
They did not live in a society like we do, where the only value you give to knowledge is what you can do with it, what you can make out of it. So that's a huge change. Now, think about this as far as progress and relating to universal agreement versus universal disagreement for the most part. Science is a practical knowledge, practical science. It's concerned with techne, doing, making, producing. So, if there wasn't, let's pretend we were all scientists here, and we're trying to work out something, and everybody's coming up with a different opinion, a perspective. Could we, as a community, progress and produce anything? We'd all be sitting arguing the whole time. Oh, I don't think you should do it that way. That doesn't make any sense. I don't believe in atoms. Um, we wouldn't get. We wouldn't do anything because it's a practical knowledge. It requires, for the most part, universal agreement as a whole. So the community says, "Okay, we're going to believe there are atoms." At some point, we've got to stop disagreeing and get to work. And getting to work requires agreeing. So is it like a foundation of accepted thought and build off of that to progress? Absolutely. Then you can go. Okay, now we've agreed on this, let's get to work. Where otherwise we're going to. Whereas philosophy is not, per se, concerned with making or producing or doing things. It's concerned more with knowledge as an end, desirable in its own right. And in that case, there's lots of disagreement. You don't have to get for philosophy to progress, you don't need to get everybody on board. We have to all say yes now before we can move to the next step. Sometimes philosophy is called armchair thinking. Because, whereas if you're a scientist, you're going to have to depend on the whole scientific community, and all the data and calculations that have been accumulated over the years to be able to sit down and do your lab work. Whereas philosophy, for the most part, you don't have to do that. Anybody can sit down in their armchair and think about, what does it really mean for me to be a decent human being in this world? What does it mean to think about these sorts of things? All these sorts of things you can, you can do by yourself. Now, it might help to, you might not get very far, and that's why you might look at people who are a lot more advanced and specialized in thinking that go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. But anybody, you don't need the same sort of agreement and community to progress in philosophy. So in many senses, philosophy can be much more individualistic as far as reward, the rewards and benefits that I don't have to get all of you to agree in order for me to learn how to become a better person. Correct? Oh man, I can't try using that excuse. I just couldn't do the right thing because I just couldn't get everybody on board to see what my project was. It's like, you can just judge and accept that report. That's a stupid. Okay, let's go to One other thing I want to tell you these two questions here where we'll try to provide a definition of science. Let's do two, go back to the helio and geocentric universe. So this will be the Earth, planets and the sun rotating around the earth and heliocentric with the sun at the center So we said which one is objectively true 
How do we know that? Now, now it's time to break down. How they track the movements of the sun from one planet to the other. Who was the first scientist to um, come up with the heliocentric? Galileo. No, not Galileo. Even closer. Starts with the sea. Copernicus. This is called the Copernicus. Galileo builds on Copernicus. Um, also, two other people, Kepler and Tycho Brahe. Brahe. Every time I do that, does anybody know who championed this scientific theory? Starts with E. Tony? Ptolemy from what city? He was mentioning Okay, so Copernicus comes up with the heliocentric universe based on evidence. Of observation. So this is gonna get difficult. He didn't. In fact, science never operates that way. We like to think that we have a theory that's positive, but not proven. Oh, I'd like an idea. I have an idea. You gather your observations, you gather evidence, test, and confirm theory. You study the history of science, it never works that way. In fact, evidence doesn't even make sense outside of the established theory. So it goes this way first. Now, uh, you can have theories with theories, but I mean a scientific theory. For example, like the atomic theory, or uh, the heliocentric theory, Einstein's theory, Newton's theory, these big kind of paradigms, that they are not accepted because people are just looking at the observations, because every looking only makes sense within the theory. The way that you look at things and observe things in this, and the evidence is very different than that. So it is the theory that provides context to what evidence and observations, because as we see, observations, can be misleading. The rubber pencil? Is it going? Yeah. <laughs> How many times have you observed something you're like, what is that? And then you have to kind of go through your memory bank of, is it that? Is it a person? Is it a dog? Is it a shadow? Is it a car? Oh, it's an apple. That's weird. Okay. Well, you have to have kind of a theory in which to contextualize what you're even seeing. There's a famous Kantian philosopher named Wilfred Sellers that says, you don't just see something. Every scene is a scene as something. You see something as a thing, depending on all the ideas and theories and concepts that you have in your mind. Think about this, you bring in a toddler. The toddler is going to see the same data right here that we're seeing. It's not like the data, the sense data is changing. Is that toddler going to see it the same way that you do? Are they going to understand the extension and support and usage as a desk? So notice everything is what we call theory-laden. All 
evidence and observation. When you study the history of science, it's the scientific community does not just gather and go. Now we now we have enough evidence to know that this is true. Theory is assumed. And we'll study the famous Thomas Kuhn's The Structures of Scientific Revolution. He uses the word revolution because that's exactly how science operates. When you hear revolution, what do you think? Hey, it's a revolution. What do you think? I think it's a revolution. Yeah, an over, it's like a coup d'etat. What's a coup d'etat? An overthrow? An overthrow of the old regime. So, at some point, and Thomas Kuhn talks about there has to be a certain crisis within the community. Um, and he likens it to a lot to conversions, like religious conversions or political conversions, that nobody is going to change their paradigm or their commitment to some world view unless they start to see there's problems. Now, that doesn't mean the, the theory is false, but problems in one's life or one's theory or ideas cause you not to be complacent. You want to, oh man, I don't want to change this or do something different. And it's that motivation for change that will start to grow to the point that when it starts spreading contagiously throughout the community, at some point, the top of the only. Well, do we have an established fact? No, it doesn't matter. So what Copernicus does is, what if? What if now, what's really interesting is in the geocentric, talk about observations, that actually fits better with your observations. Are you observing, does it feel like you're flying around the sun right now? Yeah. Are you holding onto your desk? It looks like the sun is going around us. So speaking common sense and observation, this would seem to, what possible problem might there be the Ptolemaic system that caused a sort of crisis and for them to kind of issues, kind of cracks, fissures in the that cause somebody to look and start thinking in different ways. By the way, let me just tell you, all the data of all the positions of the planets that Ptolemy reported, we still use that. It's all. Now, let me put it this way. Sometimes people say, well, look, it's because it works. This doesn't work, and this does, and that's confirmation. Isn't that exactly how we do the scientific method? So suppose you have a theory on projectiles and in gravity, well, we're going to want to test it. So we go, okay, according to your theory, if I throw this with a certain velocity and uh, vector directionality, it should land right there. Now, if every time you do it, it keeps going somewhere else. And I go, yeah, but I have a different theory. Let me tell you my theory about mass and gravity and velocity. And voila, I do it. Now, the first time I do that, does that mean, wow, this theory must be true? You're probably going to say that's a lucky Really a lucky shot. Do it again. Do it again. Yeah, close the door. And you start trying to isolate variables that could influence that. Now, you think under all those different scenarios where I'm taking away certain variables, closing the door, and I'm throwing that, and it keeps tracing out the exact parabolic arc that I said it was and hitting the exact place, aren't you going to say that confirmation? Why? Because it works. Your theory works. Here is the problem with science. The difficulties that we, we've had in the history of science. Because we need science. Scientific. We just have to understand it properly in the history of what's actually happened. As Quine, a philosopher of science, says, he has what's called the theory of underdetermination. There are an infinite amount of theories that will all equally correspond to the observations perfectly well. So I could give theory A, you could give another, now there's probably an infinite amount of theories that are also false that you can check off, which is called false oftentimes falsification, coined by Karl Popper. 
But if we all have, for example, there's what, about 36 of us in the classroom, each person has a different theory that fits the evidence and data perfectly well. How are we going to be able to choose what's the right one? It's like, well, that one works, and that one works too. And they're all different theories. In fact, the reason why I bring this up, the Ptolemaic system works perfectly well. We use the same data. We can actually predict where each planet in Jupiter is going to be at any particular time into the future. We can trace back in the past, and it works perfectly well. We still use that, all the data accumulated. Furthermore, guess what? Sailors use this system to navigate the seas and map that. It works. So although we want a scientific theory to work and to produce something, being able to get something to work is not a sign, a perfect indicator that it must be correct. It must be the true theory. Why? Because you have an infinite amount of theories that you have to choose from, and they can't all be true. If one person says, one plus one equals two, that's my theory. Another person, three, four, five, six, seven. You can't all be correct at the same time, can you? You might all be wrong, but you can't all be right. Now, the problem that occurred, the fissure in here, is something called epicycles. Has anybody ever heard of that? Retrograde motion for anybody that's taking astronomy. If you watch the planets, so it should be if the planets are, let's see, if the planets are and the sun are moving like this, you will see them rise in the east and set in the west. So not only will the sun do that, but you will trace throughout the year the stars will start to do that as well. Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, but they don't make an arc like that. They start acting a bit drunk. They start going, oh, I'm going to go, oh, I'm going back, I'm going to eh. retrograde motion. Now, how are you going to, how is your scientific theory going to accommodate and explain that observation? Being scientifically. So you think they're saying, well, there are some people up there that are kidding the baseball bat. Remember, science always needs causes. Causes of what is causing it to do that? Oh, that's actually one reason why you might need to. Now, what Ptolemy did to answer that question is imagine an invisible point traveling like this. Now, around that point, have a planet orbiting. So if you can think about it like this, this the point, the planet's going like this. Now, if I give, I'm adding two motions together. If I add this, while this, what are you seeing? It's going back and forward, back and forward. So he has to add two motions, which in science is not preferred the violation of what we call Hawking's razor. It's like, look, if you only need one circle and one point to explain it, why add two? You're complicating things. So one way to deal with that is to say, not to prove, but to say, what if? What if our perspective was different? What if we were standing in the sun but not burning up? If we're standing in the sun, would things look different to us? No. Right, yeah, they would look different. It would look like. And nicely done, I don't have to add two rotating 
circles and points. So I'm able to solve. So there might be motivational reasons to, but science is constantly changing. Science, we have a, a kind of a dictum or a law. Take anything that you, you believe to be scientific fact, and in three, four hundred years, it's going to be different. It's, which is very interesting because we always speak about science. Well, science is established. This is fact. It is this kind of dictatorship over all reason. It's like it can never change. It can never. In some sense, people would say that it's become the new church and the new priests of the modern age. The scientists are the new priests, clergy, and science is the new church that's the worship. Which had probably nothing to do with science, right? Now, here's another question. Remember what I said? If something's objective, does it change? Doesn't that worry you about history science? Now that doesn't mean, as Point says, it doesn't have anything to do with reality. The idea is to get better and better, and there's rules. When we get into philosophy of science, I'll talk a bit more about this. But let's think about philosophy, and philosophical questions as it relates to science. Here's a philosophical question: How do I know I exist? As we talked about. Now, is that a subjective or an objective? Issue. Okay. If it's subjective, now imagine I'm, I'm stepping out of the role of being a philosopher and a scientist. And let's take something that we say would be objective fact. And let's just say, for the sake of the argument, I'm looking through a telescope, I mean a microscope, and I've introduced some type of substance X into um, my petri dish of cells, and voila! Mitosis, what's mitosis mean again? Oh, vision. Okay, then I get confirmation, I test, and then I establish when you introduce substance X into the cell, you get mitosis, cell division. Now, does anybody know anything about construction? Well, let's just really wait a um, if you don't lay down a foundation, and let's say you're just going to go build out of the beach, can my second and third floor be more sturdy than... And no, it's foundational. That's why we call it a foundation. What is built on top of it can be no more sound and firm than what's underneath. That's why we lay a foundation. Well, knowledge works that way, too. So now think about this. How certain and sound can that be about cell my uh, mitosis, cell division, if I don't even know I exist? Okay, well, who the hell was looking in the microscope? What about, is there even a world or is this a matrix? Am I in a pod somewhere like Neo and some crazy AI is making me have this VR experience? Those are philosophical questions. Now think about all the things that are involved in making that scientific statement. There has to be an I observing. There, I have to exist. And if I don't know that, I can't, what's built on top of that can't be, is, is even weaker. You don't know this self, because you don't even know if there's a you. What about a world, an external world? What if you're just a brain in a vat? And it's the AI is making you think. Well, if you can't solve that, then what do you think about talking about mitosis? That's gobbledygook at this point. This is why, whether or not philosophy obtains it or not, philosophy has to be aimed at objectivity. Otherwise, everything else is gobbledygook. Everything that's foundational. And that's why when you look at the history of thought, all scientists were philosophers up until very recently. They thought about, and at some point, 
you're doing philosophy arguing until it gets accepted as a fact. And it's not based on observation. Do you think that Bohr discovered the atomic model by just looking down on the carpet? It's like, oh, you guys got to see this. This is so crazy. There's a nucleus with an electron. Hey, you didn't see that. Positive. And there'll be certain reasons to accept that. But philosophy has to be aimed at subjectivity. Now, real quick, also, the very notion of the word, let's do some etymology. The notion of the word science is kind of taking on a new meaning in our contemporary usage. We typically mean science to mean the empirical hard sciences. And did you notice that these questions are all actually built on each other? So there's kind of a, a, a logical order to that. That's why I'd ask you questions about empirical sciences. But for the ancients, and going through medieval ages as well, science meant something more broad than just empirical, empirical sciences. In fact, science comes from the word, from Latin, scientia. Does anybody want to take a stab at what scientia means? thought of every discipline as a science. So notice how we, we separate today the sciences means something very different. But it's because isn't every discipline want to know something? And what it wants to know is subject matter. Before it gets to know it, it's kind of a roadmap, is exactly what defines the of science. So if I asked you, I want to know about how to make a good tasting food. What discipline do I study? And what discipline do I create? Gordon Ramsay's. Uh, but what would Gordon Ramsay, what discipline would he be doing? Culinary. Culinary. If I want to know about numbers and magnitudes, what science is that? If I want to know about life, bios, biology. If I want to know about the mind, psyche, and breathe, psychology, good. If I want to know about correct moral behavior, it's a, it's a branch of philosophy. So when you act moral, you're being ethical, ethics. Um, um, if I want to study society writ large, sociology. If I want to study man in Greek anthropos, anthropology. Isn't it cool once you learn etymology? It's like, now notice that each one of those is directed at a particular subject matter. So when I go to study how to cook and bake and stuff like that, I'm not going to be studying morality, right? Now, sometimes they overlap a little bit, or one science might use, for example, engineering, biology, chemistry will use mathematics. But that's not what they're aiming at at the particular. I want you to know this. Okay. And oftentimes, you can go out of bounds. Um, by the way, the study of nature. In Greek, nature, phusus. Uh, I can change the pronunciation. Um, well, I'll write it out, actually. Physics. Anything beyond the nature, 
then nature being wet, you can study the five senses, or see the five senses, is beyond the category of physics. So the physicist steps out and starts talking about metaphysics or theology. You can pull up your red card and be like, "Wow, how to bounce? You've gone into the wrong, the wrong science." Now, all those are particular subjects. Do you think that tech theoretically you could have a science or discipline that is not limited? There is no out of bounds. Um, all topics can be studied. Not that you can know everything, but it's just conceptually, you could have a universal science. That, if so, what would you call it? Now you got it. Um, and we'll end with this philosophy. Here is a good. The science of all things. Humanly knowable. Now, I'll just add that caveat, humanly knowable, just in case we might find another means to obtain knowledge, not by our human faculties. Um, mind revelation or infused knowledge or something like that, or the AI is putting stuff into it. Um, I'm just not, I'm not saying that in the gravity that philosophy would be defined as that. Or sometimes the science of thinking correctly about all things. So know this, philosophy, unlike the other disciplines and sciences, is a universal science. And now you see why it's so foundational that you and one of you brought this up too. Could you really have a world in which there was no philosophy? Well, philosophy is synonymous with thinking. You're all philosophers. Did you know that even before you came in here? Why? Because you're all thinkers. Some of us are better at than others. And we come into this class to learn how to get better at thinking. About what? Thinking about numbers and engineering? No, about everything. And it's this precise reason why I will argue that philosophy is actually, in this sense, the most practical subject that you could study to prepare you for whatever field, whatever you want to do in life, to better yourself as a human being, ethically, to be in a better relationship with individuals and community. Well, you have a science that thinks deeply and broadly about all things, and in doing so, trains you to critically think and think well and with excellency. What more could you want to prepare you for life? You can do anything with this. It really is. And I can bring in some data, too, that not only are all the, the graduate entrance exams, the LSAT, the MCAT, do you know who hands down always scores the highest on those? Philosophers. Why? Because they've been trained to think correctly. Employers are hiring more philosopher majors. Philosophy majors. Why? Because they figured it out. Even if you're going into chemical engineering, they want to see philosophy. Because look, everybody can go through the chemical engineering. You're just getting kind of run-of-the-mill people that have gone through the same courses, but they're not going to know how to think about it properly and within the context and come up with new things that will help the company. Just doing that, just learning the formulas. So that's why companies and employers are looking more to philosophy companies too. So I'll bring in some of that data. Um, homework. I want you to... On this, we'll just do a few of these. Let's start with the beginning. Read over Thales. Anaximenes. And Anaximander. These are all called the Milesians, because they're from the fourth town um, in Asia Minor. Actually, Turkey. Thales. 